As we continue to make our way through the, the book of Acts, we come this morning to the, the second half of chapter 27. So Acts chapter 27, looking at the section from verse 21 down to the end, Acts 27 from verse 21 onwards. We, we noted last week that the theme of Acts chapter 27 could be, in the words of John Newton, through many dangers, toils and snares, I have already come. It is grace has brought me safe thus far, and grace will lead me home. Or in slightly more down-to-earth language, somebody told me a few days ago that they have a, a saying in their family, if God brings you to it, then he'll get you through it. Well, last week we thought about the dangers, toils and snares that Paul and his companions faced on their journey to Rome. And this morning, in the second half of chapter 27, we see the grace of God. The grace of God that kept them. The grace of God that always keeps his people. First thing I want us to consider as we look at this passage this morning is that God is faithful and kind. God is faithful and kind. The, the ship that Paul and his companions were, were sailing on towards Rome was, was caught in a great storm. We, we thought about that last week, that the storm is described graphically for us in verses 13 to 20. And it was such a great storm, such a fearful storm that went on and on over many days that, that Luke says in verse 20 that eventually we, we gave up all hope of being saved. Even Paul, even Luke finally gave up all hope of being saved. They reached a point of despair such a point of despair that they could not see a way forward. Where they thought that the promise of God was not going to be fulfilled after all. And when Paul and his companions were at their lowest point, God in great kindness drew near. And God, in great kindness, gave them reassurance. And that is what God does. This is not the only place in the Bible where the Lord's people found themselves at a low point. And God drew near to reassure them. Think of Jesus' disciples. In the days immediately following the crucifixion, they were disappointed. They were troubled. They were afraid. They locked themselves in an upper room because they were afraid of the Jews and what, what the Jews would, would do to them. And when Jesus' disciples were at the lowest point, we're told in John chapter 20 and verse 19 that on the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Jesus came. Jesus came to his disciples when they were afraid, when they were weak, when they were doubting. And he came and he gave them peace. He gave them reassurance. We, we, we often think that it's when we are strong. And when everything is going well. And when we are doing well. That the Lord will draw near to us. 
Yet the Lord delights to draw near to his people when they are weak, when they are troubled, when they are finding the way hard. And so Paul himself was able to write about something else in his own experience in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. He says, I boast gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. That's why, for Christ's sake, I, I delight in weaknesses, in, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties, for, for when I am weak, but then I'm strong. When, when Paul was weak, Jesus Christ came to him and said, Paul, my, my grace is always sufficient for you. Well, let's see how the Lord reassured Paul and his companions in the midst of the storm. He sent an angel to Paul. The storm raged for many days, and one day Paul spoke to those on the ship with him and told them about something that had happened the, the night before. Verse 23, he says to the rest of the, the people on the ship, Last night... An angel of the God whose I am and whom I serve stood beside me. God sent an angel to Paul. God sent an angel to Paul when he was in weakness and at a point of, of despair. There, there are various places in the Bible where where we read of angels being sent from God, angels being sent from heaven to, to help God's people. The most notable example of all is found in Luke chapter 22 in the, the Garden of Gethsemane, where the Lord Jesus Christ in, in agony prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane. And we're told that an angel from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him. We... We hesitate sometimes to, to speak about the, the work of angels in the world today. I think there can be a, a couple of reasons for that. Um, one is that the, the Bible doesn't say that much about the details of, of the work of angels in, in the world today. We, we read examples in the Bible, of the, the work of angels and how angels drew near to God's people to, to help them. But the Bible doesn't give much detail of how angels continue to do that today. And so we perhaps feel when we talk about angels and the work of angels that we're, we're not that well informed about what they do in the world today. And another reason perhaps that we don't speak that much about angels, it is simply that there are so many weird and wonderful ideas floating around about angels, and we, we often hear people say the most weird and wonderful things about them. And sometimes when people say weird and wonderful things about angels, we, we react by ignoring them altogether. But the Bible does tell us that angels serve God and serve God's people. There's a verse in Hebrews chapter 1. It doesn't give much detail, but it, it makes it clear. Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 14. All angels are ministering spirits sent to serve those who will inherit salvation. Angels serve. They, they help God's people. And we're, we're not told precisely when or how they do it, but in ways that we almost certainly don't realize. God sends angels to, to help us in our need. This is a sign of God's kindness to us. And not only did God send an angel to Paul, but, but God told Paul not to be afraid. The angel that was sent to Paul was sent with a message. Paul says in verse 24, the angel said to me, do not be afraid, Paul. The storm was raging. 
They were lost. They, they didn't know where they were. They, they were in despair. They, they thought there was no hope. There was, there was no way forward. And God sent a message to Paul. Do not be afraid. The point's often made that this is one of the most common commands that God gives to his people in the Bible. I don't know how many times it is. I'm sure somebody will have counted it and you'll be able to find it online if you, you do a search. But the amount of times God says to his people in his word, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. Now, why is that? Why does God keep on saying this to his people in his word? Why does he say it again and again and again? Well, well the answer is obvious, isn't it? It's because we so easily allow ourselves to be overcome by fear. It's, it's surprising, isn't it, sometimes how, how little it takes? How little it takes for us to be paralyzed by fear? And why does that happen? Why do we allow ourselves to be, to be overcome by fear? It's because we forget God. We, we forget what, who God is. We forget what God has done. We, we forget what God has said. So God comes to us again and again and again in his word. And he says, remember who I am and, and do not be afraid. But not only did God send an angel to Paul, and not only did God tell Paul not to be afraid, but God confirmed his promise to Paul. The, the background to this whole chapter is the promise that Jesus Christ made to Paul in chapter 23 and verse 11. The Lord stood near Paul and said, Take courage. As you have testified about me in Jerusalem, so you must also testify in Rome. Jesus Christ promised that Paul would go to Rome, that Paul would preach in Rome. And it seemed that that was unlikely. It seemed as though the the ship was going to be ruined, that the, the lives of everybody on board were going to be lost. It seemed as though Paul wasn't going to get to Rome. But the angel was sent to tell Paul that God's promise, Jesus Christ's promise, still stood. Paul would reach Rome. The lives of everybody on the ship would be spurred. The promise of God stood firm. You can open your Bible and you can read what to you looks the most unlikely promise that God could have made. Yet that promise is more certain, it's more secure than anything else in your life. Because the promises of the Bible are made by the God who cannot lie the God whose power extends over all things in order to fulfill his promises. So we see here God's great faithfulness and kindness in, in sending an angel to Paul and sending an angel with the message, do not be afraid, and to reassure Paul that, that God's promise stood firm. Now, how did Paul respond to the kindness and faithfulness of God, and, and how should we? Well, well, he had faith in God. He said to the, the men on the ship in verse 25, I have faith in God that it will happen just as he told me. And Paul also called himself and those with him to have courage. Verse 22, I urge you to keep up your courage because not one of you will be lost. Verse 25, keep up your courage, men. For I have faith in God that it will happen just as he told me. Keep up your courage. Some translations have take heart, even be of good cheer. 
what is at stake here is the character of God. Is God trustworthy? Do, do you believe that God is trustworthy? That you can trust everything God has said, everything God has promised? If we believe that God is trustworthy, then we will believe every promise of his word. And that will enable us to, to take courage and to, to keep going. Are you a fearful Christian this morning? Are you, are you frightened about things this morning? Well, God tells you to, to keep up your courage, to, to take heart, to remember who he is, to remember the things he, he has promised. So we see here that God is faithful and kind. But secondly, we see here that God is a God of salvation. A God of salvation. When Paul told the men on the ship that God had sent an angel to, to reassure him, he used a lovely little phrase to show that he was a Christian and to show what that means. Notice the little phrase that we find in the middle of, uh, at the end of verse 23. He said to the crew, Last night an angel of the God whose I am and whom I serve stood beside me. The God whose I am and whom I serve. That's what a, a Christian is. A Christian is somebody who belongs to God. Now, yes, on, on one level, all people belong to God. For all people are, are made by God. Oh, but the, the Christian, in a special way, belongs to God. For a Christian is somebody who has been purchased by the blood of Jesus Christ so that they no longer belong to sin and to the devil and to themselves, but they belong to God. A Christian is somebody who has been united to Jesus Christ and, and adopted as a child of God so that they belong to God and belong to the, the family of God. The God whose I am. And a Christian serves God. The God whose I am and whom I serve. Those who belong to God serve the God to whom they belong. They no longer belong to sin and the devil and themselves. And so they no longer serve sin and the devil or even themselves. But they serve God. The God to whom they now belong. The God who has loved them. The God who has saved them at such great cost. If we belong to to God, we live for God, we, we serve God. Now, of course, this can be applied in all kinds of ways. This, this applies to every area of life, every detail of life. Let, let me just give one example. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, Paul makes this point very powerfully that we, we serve the one to whom we belong. In 1 Corinthians 6, at the end of that chapter, he, he writes about sexual behavior and the sin of sexual immorality. Uh, and listen to how he brings the, the, the section to an end. He says, Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your body. Honor God. Serve God with your body because you belong to God. He, he's bought you at a price. So when God saves a person from sin and hell through the, the death of Jesus Christ and brings them to himself, they belong to him and they glory in the fact that they belong to him and they see it as their duty and their joy and their privilege to serve him. The God whose I am and whom I serve. Who or what 
do you belong to? Who or what do you serve? Can you say these words that Paul said? The God whose I am and whom I serve. It's those who belong to God. Purchased by Jesus Christ. United to Jesus Christ. Living by faith in Jesus Christ. And who show that then by, by serving God. Who find courage in the promises of God. And who will be taken home to spend an eternity in the presence of God. God is faithful, God is kind, and God is a God of salvation. But then thirdly, God is, is always at work. God is always at work. The storm took the ship along. And it took it eventually towards the island of Malta. And after two weeks in the storm, it's hard to imagine that, isn't it? Two weeks in this fearful storm, the sailors realized that they were being driven to, towards land. They, they, they became aware that they were being driven towards this island. They, they didn't know what the island was at, at this point, but they were, they were being driven towards it. And they, they feared that they were going to be dashed against the rocks, that the, the ship was going to be to be ruined upon the rocks. And so they, they dropped anchor in a, an attempt to, to prevent this. We, we read of that in verses 27 to 29. But then when they, they dropped anchor near to the island, the, the sailors on board came up with a plan to try to escape. Verse 30 tells us that in an attempt to escape from the ship, the sailors let the lifeboat down into the sea, pretending they were going to lower some anchors from the boat. The, the, the sailors could see what a, a dangerous situation they were in, so they wanted to get into the lifeboat and, and get away and, and leave the, the rest of the people on the ship to their own devices. Well, Paul <laughs> got, got wind of this, and, and he knew that if the sailors left the ship behind, well, there'd be no chance of survival. The, the, the rest of the men on board wouldn't, wouldn't know how to handle the ship. And so he, he spoke to the centurion about this, the, the, the soldier who is in charge. And he said, unless these men, unless the sailors say with the ship, you, you, you cannot be saved. And so the centurion had the soldiers cut the lifeboat away before the sailors escaped in it. Just an aside here, it's interesting and important to note that the Paul had this promise that they would all be kept safe and would get to Rome. He didn't then shrug his shoulders and think to himself, well, God has promised to keep us safe, so it doesn't really matter if the sailors escape. <laughs> we'll just let them go. God will still keep us as he's promised. No. Paul thought, God has promised to keep the ship safe. And so we need to work towards that. And we need to make sure that the, the sailors don't escape. And the same principle applies to, to all of God's promises. Think, for instance, of how God has promised to save people of all nations. How do we respond to that? We, we don't respond to that by shrugging our shoulders and saying, oh, well, God's going to save the nations, so we'll just wait for him to get on and do it. No. We respond to that by saying, God has promised to send the nations, so we take the gospel to the nations and we pray for the spread of the gospel in the nations. The promises of God drive us to to faithful service of God. Well, having foiled this attempt of the, the, the sailors to, to escape, Paul urged everybody on the ship to, to eat. They, they were going to, to try the, the, the next day to, to land the ship safely at the island. 
but they, they hadn't eaten for, for 14 days. Perhaps as we saw earlier with the children, some of the fool had spoiled. Perhaps they just hadn't felt able to eat. But if they were going to try to land the ship, they, they, they needed their strength. And so they, they ate a meal. And as we saw earlier, Paul gave thanks to God for the food in, in front of the whole crew. And then the next morning, daylight came. And it was make or break. This was the day when they would attempt to to land the ship. And so uh, we're told that they they, they saw a place, a bay with a sandy beach where they they thought they could try to to, to land the ship. And and so verse 40 tells us that they cut loose the anchors and untied the ropes, hoisted the sail, and made for the beach. But, verse 41, the ship struck a sandbar and ran aground. And then the, the waves began to, to pound the, the, the ship and the, the ship began to break up. It, it began to, to break into pieces. And the soldiers, the, the Roman soldiers, feared that their prisoners on board would, would swim away and try to escape. And that could be a, a capital offence for a Roman soldier to, to let their prisoners escape. And so they they wanted to kill the prisoners to prevent them from swimming away and escaping. But we're told in verse 43 that the centurion, who had already earlier in the passage shown kindness to Paul, he, he wanted to spare Paul's life. So he kept the soldiers from killing the prisoners. He then ordered that those who could swim jump overboard first. And the rest were to try to use planks to get to the island. And we're told in the closing words of the chapter that everyone reached land in safety. All 276 of them. So we have this account at the end of the chapter of this shipwreck. And apart from being told that Paul gave thanks to God for the food. God is not mentioned directly in this passage. And we might read a passage like this and read of this shipwreck and this this trouble that Paul and his companions faced and we, we might think to ourselves, well, where is God in all of this? When we think of the storms that come to our lives and the troubles that come to the world, we perhaps sometimes ask the question, where where is God in in all of this? And the answer to that is found in the words of Jesus Christ in John chapter 5 and verse 17 where he said, My Father is always at his work. My Father is always at his work. God's presence and God's work cannot always be clearly seen by us. But God is always present and God is always at work. Just over a a year ago in our Lord's Day evening services, we went through the book of Esther. Noted at the time that the God isn't mentioned directly at any point in the book of Esther. Yet all through that book, God is present. God is at work to, to save his people. And God was at work all through the events at the end of this chapter. Through the, the shipwreck and all the events surrounding it. In order to fulfill the promise he made in, in verse 24. Paul, you must stand trial before Caesar. And God has graciously given you the lives of all who sail with you. And even when we struggle to see it, God is at work in your life and in mine and in the life of the church. And God is at work in the world He is always at work. 
to fulfill all the promises he has made. And just as here, he was at work to move everything towards the promised destination of Paul ultimately arriving in Rome. So God is always at work to move everything towards the promised destination. The salvation of his people and the return of Jesus Christ in glory.